Joe, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have you here on the Conscious Podcast. It's a pleasure for me. So. Well, I mean, it is partly we're beaming so so widely because we worked together 24, 25 years ago at the BBC's Natural History Unit in Bristol. I know, I can't and, believe it's that long. And it was good fun, wasn't it? Right? <laughs> it really was. We, I mean, we made a film called Making Animal Babies, which we travelled all over the world for. I mean, that was hilarious. And yes. I was pregnant at the time, which <laughs> made it even more yes, complicated. You and the dolphin. Yes. Oh, sitting in the swimming pool with a dolphin doing sonar with her baby. And I was pregnant. And they were basically, the dolphins were scanning my stomach, weren't they? It was so bizarre. Mm. And then we literally scanned the dolphin, because she was pregnant, and scanned me at the same time on the side of the pool. It was... (laughs) Doesn't happen every day, does it? It was the most bizarre day, wasn't it? And then our producer, Dale, knew the sex of my baby before I did, because she got a glimpse. Did you know that? Yes. She knew. She told me, but she didn't tell me what it was. I spent the rest of the trip going, don't you dare say, I don't want to know. Don't you dare say. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, that's that's our beginnings together. But since then, you have been on this extraordinary and really inspirational journey. I mean, for anyone who thinks... God, I'd love to change the planet for the better. You, you've been there. You've done it. I mean, you're well, doing really it. Kind of you. <laughs> it's true though, and you know it because you've done this amazing work, which we will really get to the meat of um, in this episode. And I'm so excited that you could come and join us. Um, in brief, okay, let's start at the beginning. I think that's the very best place to start, isn't it? What happened after I stopped working with you at the Natural History Unit? You were still there, beavering away, and then what yes. changed? Um, yours was the only one um, that I worked on that wasn't related to underwater wildlife. So everything I was doing, I mean, starting with the original Blue Planet series and then a whole load of productions, and every single one portrayed the ocean as if it was full of life and healthy and it wasn't what we were seeing on location and I used to try and get an element of conservation into all of them but it was always taken out at the last minute with people saying um it people aren't interested in in conservation you know they 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 don't want to know about this they just just want to be entertained and I was thinking well how do we know that if we don't tell them you know, we're just not giving them credit. Plus, we're not telling the real story. And it became quite a thing because before I had joined the BBC, I'd been with WWF in Hong Kong and I'd set up their marine conservation program. So it was always in my DNA, really. So it felt wrong. And eventually, after 12 years, um, the BBC were offering voluntary redundancies. And I went to personnel to th- to sort of say, shall I stay, shall I go? You know, I was I was in my early 50s at the time. And um, I was basically told that I'd never get any higher than producer. Nothing wrong with my work. Everyone was quite happy with, with that. But it's just because you're an older woman. And that was really the trigger I needed. And I was told that twice at two separate interviews. Not in a mean way. It was just very much, you know, how it is. And I thought, yes, I do. So I then left to um, make my own program, my own film. And... I originally thought that it would be very much a BBC Two audience. You know, people already care because a film about plastic in the ocean, you know, it's kind of, it sounds even dull to me. So I never thought that people would be that interested, but something about it peaked. And I think it's because I was looking for a subject that people could understand and could change, you know, in their own lives. And ocean acidification is a tough one. So I thought with plastic, it's the very concept that we're using a material that was designed to defy nature. It doesn't break down. And we're using that material to make single-use items out of. And that's just crazy. And when you think about it, these things don't go away. You know, you throw it away, but there is no away. So it just seemed if we can make people realize that, you know, I've I've done it. I've used those single-use cigarette lighters to light barbecues and 
you know, if I've been thirsty, I've thought nothing about buying water in a plastic bottle. The very thought of it now, I just can't believe I ever did it. But it's a mindset. And once people got on board with it, it was incredible. And, and the film ended up doing really well. And um, what was particularly interesting was I had tried to tell the Blue Planet 2 production that it would be a good idea to put plastic in the environmental one. And, and it was, you know, a case of, yeah, uh, not happening. And um, But David Attenborough was in our one. And when he saw the um, the fine cut of the environmental film that was in Blue Planet 2, he said, why aren't you doing plastic? I suggest you watch Joe Ruxton's film, which they did. And that ended up being a massive catalyst for the movement. So it And it just showed that really... People do want to know. People do want to be responsible. We can all see there's problems. And if we don't understand what those problems are, how can we ever make change? So and that's as a um, filmmaker, very long answer. It, no, it's a brilliant answer. As a filmmaker, change is possible. Oh, God, it's yes. not just about entertainment, right? Mm, mm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think people want to want to do their bit and often don't know what to do. Um, but and also think that the little change that they make might not make any difference. So, you know, think, well, what's the point of me doing that? But actually, if all of us make one little change, the, the cumulative effect of that is far greater than, you know, a handful of people doing everything right. Which is the point we're constantly trying to get across on this yes. podcast. When you, though, what, one thing you've brushed off a little bit, and I'm going to hold you to it, is... So off I went and made my own film. Oh, it might make it what? sound like it was. Just, where did you yeah, Where did, did you get the a <laughs> courage to think? You know what? Actually, I'm not going to believe your story of I'm a middle aged woman, therefore I'm not able to do this thing. Where did you get the money? Where did you get? You know, how did you even start thinking I'm going to make an epic? I, well, I never thought of it like that. I honestly didn't. Um, I had heard about this problem, um, which a lot of people have heard about, which is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And um, there was an expedition going out to it. Um, they were fundraising for that. And I, I met somebody in Hong Kong that I was talking to about it. And, um, you know, I started to think, wow, that, that would be a good film. And, you know, they were keen for me to do it. And so I ended up going out there um, and we spent a month out at the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which has been described as a huge floating island of trash um, and that it's 3,000 miles wide. I think the quote is twice the size of Texas, but over the years that's now gone up three times the size of Texas. Um, and so I went more or less to do a recce because I didn't have any funding, but you know, managed to get enough just to get out there. And when you get out there, you don't see the plastic. We saw one big fishing net in the whole time we were out there. But the very, very insidious point is that if you put a plankton net in, what looks like beautiful crystal clear water comes up absolutely choked with microplastics. And you can see the zooplankton in there and they, you know, their little stomachs are transparent. You can see the plastics in there. So... I, and, and that got worse. I mean, we started trawling, I think it was 400 miles west of San Francisco. And the further we went out, the more this thing was completely choked with it. And that, as a filmmaker, was a difficult thing because I'm thinking, you know, a huge floating island would be quite something to show, particularly on a big screen. You could have all the light coming through and fish hiding underneath and all of that. But what looks like clear water with things that you can't barely see with a naked eye is not um, not terribly exciting. <laughs> and that's when I started to think, okay, so what could I do? And then I thought, well, the most charismatic animals in the ocean, you know, the great whales feed on plankton. So that might be a good starting point because people seem to care more about whales than other humans. Um, and I took advantage of that. <laughs> um, and then I started fundraising and decided to start the charity because I thought it would be easier and started giving talks about it. And I'm not very good at asking for funds. And it just seemed to be almost by accident when I was giving a talk that people came up and said, actually, we're interested in, in funding this. Um, and I was hoping that would happen again for the next one. But so far it hasn't. But I, I, I'm not the type to um, give up easily. It will. Have faith. So slowly <laughs> it grew. So. It was an organic process. Yes, Tell it was. me, just it to was. revisit that, that trip, tell me what that felt like for you to see, to witness, 
not so much as a filmmaker with a view to making a film, but as a human. Yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking um, in a way. It was heartbreaking because of the fact that we had done this to our ocean. And there were all these harebrained ideas about, you know, just cleaning it all up and putting big booms across and collecting it all. You can't. You can't because there aren't big bits to do that with. But if you were successful, you would remove that top layer, which is the phytoplankton that's busy absorbing CO2 and giving us oxygen, and the zooplankton, which is the heart of the food chain. So at the time, I didn't even know about the chemicals in the plastic. I didn't realize that actually there's a threat to human health because plastic has has a two-way process with chemicals. It will leach chemicals out. So if there are chemicals that's been used in the manufacture of it, and the one we all hear about is BPA, people talk about baby's bottles, it's been been associated with uh, breast cancer as well. So these chemicals, they... They like plastic and they'll stick to it, but, but the, what the sorry the chemicals that are in the manufacture of plastic will leach out, particularly into um, fats. So th- that if they if they they will they are in the in the plastic itself and they will end up um, leaching out and then can be taken in by anything that consumes it. But the other problem is not only do they leach it out. But the minute plastic gets into the ocean, it attracts chemicals that are already there and it attracts them like a magnet. And these chemicals have come from decades of um, agricultural and industrial runoff. So they're all there. If you put plastic in the water, like virgin plastic, it it attracts them straight away. And it was described to me as the sign by the scientist as similar to if you have a drop of petrol that goes into a puddle instantly it's across the surface she said it's like that in reverse the minute the plastic goes in it comes onto it but it doesn't mix with it it absorbs it which means it sits on it and it uses the plastic as a a taxi and then when it gets eaten the one thing that it likes better than plastic is fat so it will then be released and stored in the fatty tissues of whatever's eaten it so then it, you then actually it, explained you know, that really well because that's quite com- complicated chemistry from what I understand. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I was going to be very tongue tied there. It really clearly. <laughs> <laughs> totally um, good. And and again, it's sad, but we're finding out more and more um, in terms of the negative about the plastic. You know, this we is are. more recent science, isn't it? The the chemical stuff. Yes. Yes, and a lot was emerging as we were making the film. I mean, we at one point I thought we're never going to finish this because we're going to hear about something else. And also I would have put different solutions in at the end of the film too because there's there's a lot that's being done now. And um, But at the time it was very difficult. I, I knew I wanted to have some kind of positive outcome from the film, so put things in there. But, you know, I'm not an expert. I was learning all the time. But what I did know is if people realised there was a problem, then the really clever people would would come to the table and and want to do something. And so what happened? What was the impact of the film? Well, it it was amazing, actually. It um, it ended up being taken by Netflix and uh, it was shown in, I think, 75 countries in 15 languages. And for a and while, it's still, it was, it's still there now, isn't it? On no, it's not anymore. Oh, it's no, not? We, we had a five year, um, five years they did it for, and it was the most watched documentary on Netflix for a while. And I think it remains the second most watched. So, you know, who knew that a film about plastic pollution would actually pique people's interest? And it's because I honestly believe, Philippa, that most people are good people. And most people want to do something. But if they don't understand what the problem is, how can they possibly? just make simple behavior change. And it's incredible, actually, that, you know, when when we've shown the film, if I've been there to do um, Q&As and things afterwards, that, that the response is is incredible. And, and people just coming along and saying, I just had no idea. And, and that's all it takes, you know, just let people understand and, and they can make a difference. And, and governments will always be later, you know, in changing legislation. But nothing drives them like the bottom up approach you know the kids getting involved particularly and just not accepting it and consumers getting involved you know there's so much we can do we don't have to wait for policymakers and scientists to unravel all of our problems 
So it's not just a case of of making people aware and making them fall in love with the ocean. You've gone one step further from most filmmakers. I mean, David Attenborough said you were responsible for starting the plastic free movement. That's extraordinary. Well, bless him. I mean, I had quite a leg up from him. He's he's been an amazing um, ally for us, definitely. So you're seeing all of this plastic in the ocean. Where is it actually coming from? That's an interesting one because people think that it's been dumped by ships, but actually 80% of it comes from the land. And it's not just the rivers. If you think about all our streets are designed to drain rainwater. So anything that gets dropped on the street can end up in a storm drain. And from there, it's a very easy process out. So it, it's any water courses, any streams, any drainages, and of course, our rivers that will take it away. So we did a, a study in Hong Kong where kids in school had made these wax balls with little tiny radio transmitters in, there were 10 of them. And they dropped them all around the territory and then tracked to see where they went. And one had gone all the way up to Taiwan and it had gone from an urban playground. So it just made them realize that, you know, the impact of dropping things where where we are, you know, whatever you drop, even if it's a little sweetie wrapper, that will break down into microplastics once it gets into the ocean. And plastic's very light, you know, it blows off landfills, it blows off the back of lorries and things. So it's very easy. And the ocean's always the, you know, the, the, the final place for it. And as humans, we're so out of sight, out of mind. In oh, terms we really of are. Art. And we need to connect to the ocean. You know, it, it, it's there. It's it's there for us. It's it's keeping us alive. It's controlling our weather. And it's absorbing so much heat from the CO2 that we produce. It's, you know, we need it. It's our ally, our biggest ally, particularly in climate change. So alongside making the film, you know, anyone else would have sat going, right, well, I am quite a good filmmaker it appears so I'll sit now with my legs crossed and a cup of tea and I've done my, done my job for you it's a it's bigger than that it's way bigger than that I mean that was just almost just the start of it because you endlessly are doing speeches and talks and as you say raising awareness and building that constant pressure and that's how change happens right yes I, I, I guess it is um I like to see I like to see responses um, from people because the more people you get involved, then everybody starts to become, you know, an ocean conservationist. I mean, our, our charity is called Ocean Generation, and one of the many goals we have is to engage 50 million imperfect environmentalists. And by that, I mean 50 million people making one little change together is going to have such an impact you know you, the, there's people that I really admire who will never travel by plane will always take the bus or walk don't eat any any meat or dairy you know all of these things and and don't you know so careful with what they throw away and I think that's amazing and I'm not one of those people you know I do what I can and if everybody just did one little thing if you think in you know, these really hot countries when you when you, you walk into a, a building and you're boiling outside and then suddenly you've got to find a cardigan because the air con is so fierce. Mm -hmm. I mean, just every single one of those tower blocks, just turning the thermostat up a bit, that would have a massive impact if everybody did it. And th that's the idea that everybody can do something rather than just giving up and leaving it to others. Exactly. And, mm. and Sylvia Earle, who you will have a lot in common, yes. in common with, obviously, because she's an ocean conservationist. Yes. That's that's where, it, you know, she really coined that phrase for me, that oh, idea does. that we can all do something because we're so busy disempowering ourselves by saying, exactly. well, nothing I can do about it. It's too big. No, she, it's she's too amazing. Big. And and her positivity is is incredible as well. And um, it's interesting actually. I, I've just been to Antarctica with um, Sylvia. Well, not just this year. I went to Antarctica with um, with Sylvia. And um, when you when you're there and you're witnessing things which you know have changed, um, and the fact that you're getting rain in Antarctica and there's there's snow algae and all these signs of of it warming and things. 
she's still very positive. She's still talking about what an incredible, unique time it is now to be alive because we have all the science. We know all the mistakes we've made. We know how to change them. We never knew that before. Now we do. You know, it's up to us to make those changes and it's up to us to persuade the powers that be to make it um, and, and particularly the corporations. You know, that's our biggest challenge because we know what to do. And getting people on board with that is so important. But Sylvia still remains positive. And when I think about, I've been to a lot of, you know, these big ocean conferences and, and sat on panels. And often the last question you get, because everyone's addressing problems, is do you still have hope? And I've not been to any where somebody goes, oh, no, there's no hope. If you say there's no hope, for a start, people will bury their heads in the sand and just carry on. But I honestly think there is. You know, I never thought that the whole business with plastic could change. You know, now I see people bringing their own bags and, you know, they've got their, their water bottles when they go out and their takeaway coffee cups. Yes, not everyone's doing it, but so many people are. And it's those changes I notice that, you know, and when I go to schools, it's incredible because the, the, the kids are so on board with it and they embarrass the teachers and everyone around them into doing the right thing. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you've got to look for positivity, right? Goodness me, yes. And that's what keeps me going. And, uh, you know, I look at, I've, 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 since I saw you, there's four grandchildren have come onto the onto the scene, my four little granddaughters. And um, and I just love to see the way they care about it. You know, we're, we're living in, in, in Cornwall. We're always on the beach and in the sea and stuff. And their respect for the ocean is wonderful. They understand it. And they're always, I mean, even when they were tiny, they'd find bits of plastic. No, no, look what I found. And, you know, it's it, it's good. It, it's, it's good that people are growing up to know that. So... Um, Yes, I won't be stopping anytime soon. So what next then? Well, that was going to be my next question. And there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not stopping. No, absolutely not. Um, no, with with um, the film The Plastic Ocean, everything we did was about plastics and our charity was called Plastic Oceans. And it got to the stage where, you know, after so many years, I, I wanted to talk about something else. But it wasn't just that because that's quite personal. Um, it was the fact that after our film came out and then after Blue, Pan Blue Planet's episode became such a massive success, things have almost gone the other way. Um, it seemed to start a slew of really doom and gloom documentaries. And, you know, even the BBC, there was one when I, I, I saw David Atten sort of put his head in his hands like this and the whole thing faded to black and white and, you know, you just you've got to watch so much. And you think, oh no, oh, and it just it just takes the wind out of your sails. You know, you kind of think, oh, there's just no point, and that just keeps happening with these doom and gloom films. And doom and gloom makes the media anyway. I mean, if you sit and listen to the news, I mean, and, and now we're at a particularly bad time, but even so, it's the bad stories that make the news, and it can be very depressing. And I don't feel that we're anywhere near that stage with the ocean. So I'm almost going too far the other way now. Not like Blue Planet was. It's telling stories, but it's it's linking it to why it's important that we conserve this. So um, we changed our name and the work that we're doing. The name is now Ocean Generation. And what we're doing is working to restore a healthy relationship between the ocean and humanity. And we do that. Everything is based on science. I mean, everything is double peer reviewed science. So we don't, we don't do any sensationalism, but we unravel the, the complicated science. You know, there's no jargon and it's, it's very positive. So for example, COP, which we're working on at the moment, um, if you, it, it it can get very complicated. It's a lot of world leaders. It's a lot of scientists. It's it's the policymakers. It's the corporations. People like us will will just think, well, what can I do? You know, let them talk about it. Hopefully, we'll get a good outcome. But actually, what we do is we're extracting the nuggets that are interesting from it and putting them up on our social media um, platform so that people can understand it. People can feel part of it. They can have conversations about it. You know, you don't you don't need to have read all the science papers behind it because, you know, I certainly don't anyway. But 
we've got a wonderful social media team and we have our, our um, onboard scientists as well. And they're just working so hard just to unravel it so that, you know, age three to 80, 83 or 93, people can still get something out of it and understand, plus picking the positives out because there are positives. It's just that the news doesn't like to broadcast them and I, and I don't know why. So it's it's talking about the ocean in a very positive way. Um, but it's also bringing incredible stories about the ocean because people just don't understand it. People, our kids are still taught that we get all of our oxygen from the trees and that they absorb all of our CO2. And yet we get half our oxygen comes from the ocean and it absorbs much of the CO2 as well. It is our life support system. So the ocean has to be healthy to support life. So I think if our kids grew up knowing that, you know, it is our life support system. Why would we be trashing it? If you understand it, then you care more. You know, you learn about it and, and you protect what you love. So it's a very positive way of looking at it, but also helping people to be able to play their part in protecting it. And the thing I really take hope in myself when I'm feeling quite down is those stories like the one that we heard recently about the blue whales you know re-inhabiting an area that they were gone from yeah. because they'd been hunted yes um, that they are coming capacity back. yeah that capacity for nature to to reinvigorate mm. and revive and all of yes. those lovely re-words you know yes. um it's there the recovery yeah. can be surprisingly quick, actually. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, look what happened in lockdown. It was like Mother Nature had told us to go to our rooms and think about it, you know, and nature kind of carried on and bounced back. And, you know, it, it's that easy to protect it. It's so easy. We just do nothing. You know, that's, that's let it do it for us. And, um, but, you know, understanding it, there's so much we can do and there's so much we can learn. and so much we can teach you know the, the next generation and we start today with you know swapping out a plastic bottle for a glass one or you know all of those all of those things plastic though is insidious in our lives I mean mm. it's really hard even when you're focusing on it to get rid of it mm. um, it's in it's even in our makeup it's in you know everywhere we look what are some key pieces of advice that you can give us for places where we might not will know the swap your water bottle out kind of advice, but are there other places that we could look at and easily make changes in our lives? There's two that, that really strike me that people don't seem to think about. One is, one is butter. You know, why buy butter in a plastic dish and replace it whenever every time it runs out, you know, Buy it in, in wrapped in paper. You still can, um, and have a little butter dish. If you if you find it too cold, you know, when you keep it in the fridge in the summer, you can just use a potato peeler, and that will just get you some thin butter pieces out. That's <laughs> so really things like too. that. Um, soap's another one. Why do we have to have soap in a plastic bottle? And then when that runs out, if if you buy solid soap lasts for ages it gets you clean and what I've started doing now is putting it in my case if I'm traveling somewhere or put it in my drawers and then your clothes smell lovely as well so when you buy them just store them there and um and that's you know that's a very easy swap out um I mean there's there's so many once you start to get that mindset you'll you'll look at all sorts of ways you can change another thing I think is worth mentioning is the recycling that you know the, the the sort of standard recycling people seem to think it's a perpetual process like it would be with aluminium it doesn't matter how many times that goes through the system you'll always get good stuff at the other end plastic down cycles every time and so i think the global figure is 13 percent for plastic that gets recycled of that 13 percent only one percent goes through more than once so it it, it yeah, it's it's not really a solution. It's it's a kind of a delay, and so much gets burnt. So it's it, it's not the answer that we thought it was. You know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, but I prefer to drink this, and and it's okay because I recycle. It's not really. You know, you're still that plastic's still going to be around. 
And I mean, so, it's, better, um, it's better than not recycling it. It's better than it not recycling the it. That's the only thing, yeah. yes. I mean, if you, you know, I'd buy, buy the glass exactly. bottle. Yes, I, I still put plastic out for recycling because I haven't quite nailed not um, buying it, you know, food packaging and things like that. But, you know, again, if everyone does their bit, that that's that effect is going to be good. And the other thing in your mindset is if you do make that little change, it means that you're not contributing to the problem. You're actually contributing to the solution. Doesn't matter how big that way is. At least you've taken the bad bit out to, to do that good bit. And, and, you know, that's another thing. There's, 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 there's a, a, a two-part process to it. You're adding to the problem less and you're actually giving to the solution. So um, that might be something to think about when people think there's nothing I can do. There's so much we can do. And inspire us some more. I mean, I know you've had the most extraordinary travels. You know, the, I mean, the, the film took, what, four years to make? Eight. <laughs> Eight years. I thought it was four. <laughs> I mean, where did you go in that in eight years you traveled the world right we did do a lot I mean we went to the centers of three oceans um and that was interesting because the Pacific is the one that everyone thinks is really bad but the Atlantic's just as bad um in fact wherever we wherever we did plastic trawls we were doing them in Antarctica um this year and there wasn't a single trawl that came up without plastic fibers in it um, and it just shows how, you know, ubiquitous it is and the ocean currents will take it anywhere. So, you know, it, it, it's one ocean, doesn't matter where it is, it's going to be affected. So, um, yes, we, we it was the ocean bit that really got me. We, we did go to communities that were where people were just living. It, it, you know, it's almost like they were living in landfills. It was it was so sad and burning plastic constantly and so many people coughing and you know we were, I mean none of us were doctors or, or or you know weren't doing epidemiological studies we couldn't say well you're all coughing because you're constantly breathing in plastic smoke and um, this is plastic that's come out of the ocean onto the beach you mean well it's not that I mean I'm, or... that there it that's it it's also a two-way thing yes it's coming up on, onto the onto the shore so it washes up from other countries but we were in Tuvalu um, which used to be part of Kiribati. And one of the things that they did when um, they got their independence was they started importing goods from mostly um, around Asia and Asia Pacific. And whatever they imported came wrapped in plastic. And of course, it's a tiny island. And that the solution to, to all of this was just to um, burn it. And we did speak to one of the doctors at the hospital there, and she said the cancer incidences were very high. Um, you know, was it because of that? Well, probably, but you know, it's it's hard to say. But it was it was very sad to see the people. There was one in particular. She was a, a young mother. I think she was twenty five, and she had four children. And she was talking about her childhood and how she used to swim in the lagoon. And as she did, you know, she'd sort of had this heavy talk. And then as she spoke about her childhood, this beautiful smile how they used to swim and fish in the lagoon. And she said, now nah, nah, we can't ca catch the fish in there um, because it's all full of plastic. And then she said, we feed it to the pigs. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, the chemicals going straight into those pigs who, you know, they're eating the pigs too. So it, it was it, uh, listening to her talk, and even when I watch it now, on, on you know, when I've had to watch it back on the film, I get such a lump in my throat. And what because can they it's do? It's just, it's, uh, sorry? It's a trap. They're trapped. And they're absolutely, absolutely. But there are incredible um, solutions now. But the other thing which gave me a lot of hope, and I didn't have time to put it in the film because I didn't discover until after the film was finished, was amazing communities, um, particularly throughout um, Asia, where they are having plastic-free towns and the people have taken it upon themselves. And... They're, they've gone back to wrapping vegetables and things in, in banana leaves. They just will not accept the plastic and everything they're doing is plastic free. And these people are amazing. And the local municipalities think it's brilliant because they're not having to go and take all the trash out. And then there's, you know, systems that they've got where they're, they're planting these reed beds and bringing the fish back into these canals, which had all been choked up with it before, you know, People are amazing and resilient and to see what they're doing whilst we were at the time continuing to ship our plastic waste 
out to developing countries when we knew that there was no infrastructure to deal with it and they were getting paid to take it. I mean, it was just all so wrong. You know, I was thinking, yeah, we recycle. No, you don't. You're sending it to people who don't have anything to be able to deal with it. And obviously it then goes in the environment there because what do they do? So it was, you know, it's been a big learning curve and there's been joyous moments and very sad moments. But I think my overall takeaway is I'm glad I did it, even though it was it was very hard. And it has made a difference. I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think so. But then, of course, so did Blue Planet too. They did, you know, it was when they finally did it, it was fantastic to see um, the results and that, that they probably got their film into many more places than ours. And you must have seen some solutions out there in the ocean. Uh, what What is working and what is not when it comes to actual ocean cleanup? Is there anything well, that we... Well, yeah, been, I mean, ocean we're, we're cleanups... We're innovative as humans, looking on the yeah, we glass are. half full size. We are, but we, we can't go out and collect it from the ocean centres, preventing it from getting there in the first place. So if there are, if plastic's coming down rivers, because think of those as, as, you know, the arteries of the land that that leading everything down to the sea. So catching things at river mouths is a good idea, but what do you do with it? The recyclers that make things from plastic don't want old ocean plastic. They, you know, they want the, the, the PET is the, is the main one, the one that our bottles are made from. You know, it's clean, it's food grade, it can be turned back into good plastics. All the mixed plastics, there's very little you can do with them. But stopping them getting into the environment is fine. The ideas that come up, um, you know, make park benches out of it, cover roads with it, it's not really the answer. You know, how much of this beautiful planet do we want to cover in black plastic? Because the minute you mix any colours together, it's like when kids get paints, it always ends up very dark, doesn't it? You know, so you yeah. can't, it's hard to add colours to it. Um, and, and, you know, with plastic, the recycled plastic is normally very dark. And yes, okay, you can make benches out of it, but we just, we don't need that many. And one of the problems with putting it on roads as a surface, it sounds ideal, but one of the biggest um sources of microfibers in the ocean is car tires it's something like 28 percent of microfibers has come from car tires so when you have a car and you know eventually you've got to buy new tires it's because they wear down and those just then go into the into the um the drains and you know straight out into the ocean so actually making those tires wear down on more plastic is isn't is really not going to help so um Oh, gosh, you asked me for good ones. I've just given no, you reasons but then, why. Can I just say also, the other one that, you know, again, comparatively recently we've just been introduced to is the idea that even when we're tumble drying, or not oh, tumble yes. dry much, but or washing, yes. we're, we're doing it, we're plastic polluting then as well. I know, it's difficult. And then you, you've got to buy everything that's natural fibres and it costs more. But maybe, you know, we do have too much of a consumer brain on when we're, when we're shopping. You know, if you buy something and value it, don't wash it quite so much. I do have a guppy bag that I wash fleece things in. And to be honest, I've never Wait, seen what? any fibers in it. You have a what, what? A guppy have bag. A what? What's a guppy <laughs> called... bag? Tell us about it. <laughs> it's, it's a bag, um, a washing bag. So you put your washing in it and it's got very, very fine mesh and it will trap microfibers. Um, that's one thing. But Cleaner Seas have brought out a filter for washing machines which you can retrofit to any washing machine i hope you realize i'm pointing over at my washing machine right now you can, you can retrofit <laughs> and when the, when it's full you then send it to them they remove the fibers and that goes into some recycling and then they will send you the new filter so because oh, i think if we had idea. our own filters there's going to be somebody that washes it under the tap isn't there so <laughs> they're by negating any good they've done Yes. So cleaner seas. And cleaner what, seas are okay. Cleaner seas. We we want one of those, right? Yes, do cleaner seas. Uh, I think they're just starting to sell them because it was all for commercial ones, and I think they're just going into household ones now. Um, some of the chemical recycling is brilliant. Um, some isn't. The one that I hold the most hope out for is um, Mira Technology, and they seem to have thought about everything. And the first plant has just opened in the UK, up in Teesside. It's a process that was developed at the University of Sydney. So um, that's another one that, that gives me hope. And that seems to be a completely circular system. And even the chemicals are taken off and go back to be used in the chemical industry and the water that they use as well. It's, it's, um, it's very, very low energy 
um, almost zero emissions. So they give me a lot of hope. I'd love to have had them in the film, but they they didn't exist. Um, you're, gonna put, you're gonna have to make a part two. You know that. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, yes, yeah, so we're running out of time. I do rabbit on, don't I? I love um, that you rabbit on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's our filming days were all the better because we both wrap it on. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, we have with us who also wrap it on. <laughs> yeah, but but no, I mean, that's that. There's there's a lot that give me hope, but the biggest change will come from us because if we don't use it in the first place, if we make if we look at our own plastic footprint, that change is going to be far more powerful than waiting for technology to come in. Give me an image. Give me one image from all your time out there filming that sticks on that in your particular head. film. Yeah, that sticks in your head like a a good photo. Uh, this is why we're doing it. A moment. A, I a think memory. the blue whales. The blue whales that we filmed off Sri Lanka. Um, that was an interesting shoot because. Do you remember the tsunami that happened in two thousand and? 11 the boxing day we were out in the water then and these blue whales they come every day they go to the same upwellings which are off the continental shelves it's about 30 miles south of sri lanka and they would come there to feed and the tsunami happened and the whales disappeared so obviously with the tectonic movement they just went out to deep water i'm saying obviously i have no idea they weren't there presumably with the tectonic plates moving it would make it would make sense yeah it kind of makes sense doesn't it and and I was just thinking oh this is going to be a disaster and it was our first shoot and I just got enough money together to make the shoot and um you know we, we, we were staying offshore and you know brought everyone out because I just wanted to get these these shots and 10 days later we we still had almost nothing we had a little bit from the surface but there were these crazy unregulated whale watching boats all over it and chucking plastic bottles in as they ate their lunch waiting for them so anyway but it was really difficult and to get camera crews underwater safely was almost impossible because there were just engines going everywhere but we went back every day to that place and it was the last day and it was honestly you hear this all the time but believe me this happened we had to go back because we had a flight the next day. We had to get back up to Colombo. Um, and we turned back and we were taking cameras out of the housings and starting to pack up. And Lindsay Porter, who was our cetacean biologist, was up on the flying bridge and she suddenly yelled, whales. And we did a handbrake turn in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> Everything back in. There were about seven whales, including a baby that was very inquisitive and was just coming round and round us. And we got all of those shots of the whales then. But the other, I guess the other thing was the slick of um, plastic waste that was there at the same time. And here's a fact for you. When a blue whale opens its mouth, it takes in 75,000 litres of seawater, which it will then, it then pushes its tongue up, as I'm sure you know, to push all the water through its baling plates to trap everything that's there so in like that seventy five thousand yeah. liters you, you know you have to wonder how much plastic was in there so um it was bittersweet it was incredible to be surrounded by these beautiful massive creatures but at the same time you're thinking what have we done to you it was um yeah those those, those two images really or two sides of the same image give me one thing to do now give me my homework miss joe <laughs> oh goodness me. one thing that I do today that I keep doing every day that's going to make a difference well do you think you've learned something today that you didn't know before because I know that you're very well read and and you care a great deal if there's anything you've learned that surprised you tell five people whether you'll tell five today I don't know but also it maybe how many have subscribers we get Oh, goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm, we're doing a podcast, aren't we? Of course we are. You've forgotten <laughs> You've done your you. homework. <laughs> go into your, I'm going to blush now. Go into your kitchen and just look at all the things that you could have replaced with something else so that next time you do, 
and you'll be surprised. You really will. You really will. And there's, there's, um, you know, even things like makeup. There's a lot of companies that are um, doing the right thing. Even the makeup palette, where you can pop out, you know, a little metal thing and put the new one in. And there's so many things you can do. I haven't mastered the toothpaste tablets yet, but I'm not perfect. Wait, what's a toothpaste tablet? They're tooth. Instead of doing a squeezy um, plastic tube, it's a tablet that you chew, and then brush around I suppose I haven't tried it and I look at them they come in little oh, glass jars there you go that's right, my find work. I'm going off to investigate how Let do I me get know. rid of toothpaste tubes <laughs> yes refill shops definitely sell them and, and I look at them and think I really should but um no I haven't I haven't done that one yet none of us are perfect but we can all do something no, exactly. exactly no thank you so much we are running out of time I, but we well and have done in the past, could talk all day. (laughs) No, it's such a joy, and I hope to see you in person soon.